Thaddeus Curry Productions presents Unforgiven, Chapter 2. In this chapter, dear listener, you will understand partially the path in which Jake Brogan is taken. The path leads from trauma. Further down the rabbit hole, self-destruction and obsession. Desire to understand answers, find the truth no matter what the cost, as well as the heart of a man's denial. You will also see the origins and partial motive to a very powerful immortal being's actions, as well as where her species has come from. You will witness her pain. losing the love of her life, which will definitely lead further to her own path, some ways of self-destruction, and some ways of redemption, I present to you, Unforgiven, Chapter The year is 2008 and Jake Brogan sits in his office. The man is shaking violently. He has just seen the most horrific crime scene in which any man could imagine. He had been called not even five hours ago in which, after a welfare check, two beat cops had reported a very grisly homicide. The location had been a very nice estate in the Heights of Houston. Three bodies were found. The father, a man named Adam Schweitzer, a very well-known real estate mogul, ran his own company. Of course, this is 2008, so it's easy to think that maybe he had been corrupt or something along those lines due to the housing crash for the period of this time. Maybe there was the reason for foul play. However, Neighbors, as well as friends, always say, you know, basically they all say the man was impeccable in his integrity. So that puts that out right there. He had no known enemies. He had been found dead in his office. Every bone in his body shattered. Almost every bone. He looked as if he'd been run through a compact, basically a compactor or a compressor. His wife, Abigail, wasn't in much better shape. She'd been found in the living room. Also, very dead, obviously. Her head, also missing. Every bone in her body, broken. Almost. She'd been found sitting on the couch. The worst was their daughter, Helen. That in itself... Yeah, Jake remembers that one. He shudders, wanting to vomit even now. He trembles, rubbing his face with his hands. She also had been found just laying casually in her bed and missing her head. The thing is, their heads had been removed, but not cut off. They'd been torn off by something. Whatever kind of weapon was used or animal had done it, it cannot be known. And <laughs> to say the least, eh, it's a real mess. No prints were found, no DNA, no hair, nothing. And that's not the worst part of it. The bodies have been found devoid of blood. And written in blood in the living room, as well as the kitchen, in their blood, the words, the hounds are loose. That is the only evidence of anything of this horrific foul play that was left. Torn apart bodies, no heads, and written in their blood, the hounds are loose in the living room and the kitchen. No prints, nothing. I'm sorry, man. Jake's partner, Samuel says. He's a slightly, he's a big guy himself, and not quite as big as Jake. 
He's a couple inches shorter and quite a bit younger. He's a younger African-American man. He himself had risen as a detective with record speed. Actually, one of the smartest men on the force. Jake had taught him everything he knew. The two, despite their short time as partners, they grew close. What are you talking about, man? He asks. I'm dumb. That's what I'm talking about. You know, after all is said and done with this shit, I'm turning in my badge. I'm turning in my gun. This is, that's it. That's a wrap. I can't do this shit, man. Look, Sammy, it's going to be all right. I promise, man. We just have to, you're going to do what you want to do. But I'm telling you right now, man, whatever did that, look, we still have to find the boy. We have to find their son. I mean, come on. You know something happened. And I think we owe it. Yeah. That's the thing, man. That little boy, David. That's his name, right? Yeah, of course. You know that as well as I do. Yeah, well. Let me tell you something. I don't think that little boy is alive anymore. Supposedly he was sighted walking away from that house, right? Supposedly with the woman. I don't know, man, but I'm telling you right now. I don't know if something conjured was responsible for this, something called out from the pit. I don't know. I'm telling you. I'm done. I plan on uh, getting the hell out of here. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I'm telling you, man, if I were you, I'd walk away from this. I can't fix this. No way in hell. Those people deserve some kind of justice. Their friends, their family, they deserve answers, damn it. And you shouldn't be wa Well, guess what? You're facing this on your own. I'm sorry, brother. I'm done. And once everything is said and done, Samuel keeps to his word. He walks away and does not look back. Things do not get better for Jake. Not one bit. Samuel Cardigan keeps to his word. He does not look back. He gives the chief his gun and his badge, as well as his resignation, right then and there. There isn't time to partner Jake with anyone else. He's pretty much stuck with this on his own. He has a chief breathing down his neck, as well as, of course, the newspapers spinning their part of it. And what I mean by that is, it's all over the press. And you have to understand something. Mainstream media, they aren't any different back then than they are now. So suffice to say, people are terrified. They're literally convinced, and they may not be too wrong, that some kind of modern-day Madison cult is running throughout Houston, killing people left and right. Suffice to say, especially the upper-class parts of Houston, people are really scared there. Many kids aren't even allowed to leave their homes. Many of them aren't even allowed to go to school. The mayor was wanting answers yesterday. The problem is, there is nothing to be found. There had been three people of interest seen around the property, and possibly even inside the property. The problem is, well, straightforward. The alarm has been disabled, and even outside cameras had detected nothing. However, there had been footage of the boy. Adam and Abigail's son, a boy about six years old, a child named David Schweitzer. The kid was rumored to be very precocious, very imaginative, very, very outgoing, even if he was a little bit rebellious in his own right. But he was simply a typical precocious six-year-old boy. Jake even sits down and talks with the child's former sitter. She says that he had, he had gotten angry with his mom and said he was going to make her disappear. But of course, that's simply a child's, you know, talking a little mess. No more, no less. But that in itself sits deep within Jake. Why would it, of course, you have to understand, the man is troubled and he's dealing with a horrific amount of stress on his shoulders. And normally, while well, you would think, you just blow that off as a kid throwing a tantrum. We all do this as children. But in the end, that right there starts to plant the seeds. There have been rumors of the boy being taken by one of those three people of interest. A woman, a small but beautiful woman, 
slim, very petite, with black hair, dressed fairly well. Supposedly, the cameras outside of the property had definitely shown images of the boy walking away. He seemed to be holding someone's hand. However, there was no image of who the person he was holding the hand with. It seemed like he was literally holding the hand of an invisible friend. And then, of course, the boy vanished. Everything else is not known. It's a matter of conjecture. But right then and then begins the descent of Jake Brogan's spiraling to despair and darkness. He spends months and months and months trying to figure out what is going on with this case. He actually starts to suffer within a matter of years' time. We now focus upon that. The man's wife, a woman named Megan, she says to him, You didn't even come home for his birthday, Jake. Mark was asking about you. He was crying. Doesn't the matter say anything to you? Look, back off of me. You understand? I forgot. How, how the hell can you forget your own son's birthday? Tell me that. Is your work that important to you? I was looking for answers, all right? I almost found them. But then you called me, and you inter the person I was talking to, they just... I don't give a fuck about your case. I give a fuck about our son. You get it together. You know what? One of these days, me and Mark, we're not going to be here when you get home. What did you just tell me? He grabs the woman and slams her against the wall, grabbing her by the throat. What I said is, I want a divorce. She said, looking him right in the eye. That's what I'm saying. Never before in his life had he ever laid a hand on his wife. True, his job had been very frustrating. And he tended to take his work definitely home at times. But he was always pretty good about not doing this. But now, the look of anger and hatred in her eyes and shock, he realizes now there is no looking back or turning back. His spiraling goes further. We now focus. In the chief's office, the man is disgusted as he looks at Jake. The big man looks a mess. He hasn't bathed in days, and he smells like funk. And I don't mean going down to Funky Town either. It stinks. His, his basically his unshaped, the five o'clock shadow is more like uh, the ten o'clock shadow, if you get my drift. The chief speaks softly. You know, man. Your ass is going to be taking a leave of absence. That's what you're going to be doing. I was just talking with a couple of witnesses on the last case that I was working. And you're a poor liar. I know what you've been doing. You're still trying to poke after that Schweitzer case. We're not going to find anything, okay? You're just going to have, you're going to, have to accept this on your record, all right? You're lucky you weren't fired, but even the mayor is kind of accepting. Some things are beyond anyone's control. It took a lot of, a lot of talking, but I'll be honest, man, the way you've been going, I mean, hell, your wife doesn't want anything to do with you. You drove away your last partner. Olivia's completely disgusted. I'll tell you right now, she was one of the most laid back <laughs> folks we had here. She was a damn good cop. She was a bitch that didn't know how to keep her mouth shut. Yeah, well, guess what? Keep that up. You ain't gonna be uh, having a leave of nothing, but out the door for good. I'm not going to have you disrespecting a fellow officer like that, especially not in front of me. <laughs> you idiots have no idea what you're messing with. And what's that supposed to mean? It's the boy. He's still going on about that. That kid is probably dead in a ditch somewhere. To be honest with you, he might be the lucky one, especially after what was... <laughs> you know damn well what I mean. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he was the one responsible. He said it he said it himself. He wanted his family to disappear. Well guess what? Their heads sure as hell did. You know what, man? I'm also gonna get your ass a psychiatric evaluation. You've been doing this for too long. 
I've already, you've already gone through three freaking therap, you've already gone through three therapists. I'm kind of at the end of my rope. You used to be a good cop. <laughs> yeah, and so did you. What did you say to me? You heard me. I want your gun and your badge. Now. On my desk. You're done, Brogan. Done. The man <clears throat> calmly slams his, his badge and his gun on the chief's desk. He laughs bitterly. I want to find answers one way or the other. You know that, right? If I see you even an inch near this case, or anything relating to the Switzers, I'll have your ass under the jail. Fuck you. The man laughs bitterly, flips the chief off, and walks out the door. One more step down the rabbit hole into the darkness. You know it's funny, the man weakly says from where he sits, looking Mirrodin dead in her eyes. It's the irony, and I listen to him. Your chief? Yeah. Chuck was... He was a cop's cop. He always went by the book. In some ways, he pissed a lot of people off that way. Maybe me especially. But if I listened to him, I think had you listened to that man, he would not be here. Yeah, no shit. She shakes her head in pity and disgust. You look very, you look very dehydrated, Mr. Brogan. Yeah, if I could have some water, I'd appreciate it. He says. She calmly gets up. She takes her time, but she definitely gives him some water. A small plastic cup. She allows him to drink it. Slowly. With his undamaged hand. Of course, the poker is still sticking out of his shoulder. But he's able to manage. She takes the cup. You might have, have a light. She nods slowly, and she allows him to finish the cigarette that he had started earlier. She throws the cigarette butt in the trash, and sits in a chair across from him. Quite literally, the, the chair facing reverse, she's sitting astride it, basically. Her long nailed hands curl around the back of the chair, and she looks him dead in the eyes, studying him. I suppose you want answers. I will strive to give them to you. I'm a last of me word. Who killed his parents? Was it a freak like you? Three of them, I believe. You said that yourself? The man nods as she smirks, revealing very sharp bangs that have dropped. From behind full lips. <laughs> You're saying that he never told you. He alluded. But I've been tracking them for some time. And when I find them, I promise you. They will die. And there's no doubt of that. There's three of them and one of you. You're strong. I <laughs> mean... Believe me, I've been... <laughs> I spent three years in the military. I was among the best of the best. I was actually able to take out my drill sergeant. And a spar. It tore my ass up through different things later, but... I was able to take him down a peg or two. No man has ever done... What you did to me. A three against a one. That didn't make much sense. You're delusional, he says. She laughs softly. I am one of the oldest of me kind, Mr. Brogan. 
They were not one of mine. They're most likely one of me brothers. Most likely me younger one. What are you talking about? I am roughly 2,000 years old. I was born possibly... I would say... Maybe 50 years after Christ was crucified. He looks at her in shock. He wants to call her a liar. But the look in her eyes... It confirms. They will be dealt with, I promise you. I guess I just needed to confirm certain things before I made me move. Why don't you ask your boy toy? The rest of it. She very calmly reaches over and grabs one of his legs, his knee. She squeezes down with enough pressure. With her, it's just obvious she's barely even squeezing his leg. But the strength that's behind that grip is enough to actually pop cartilage. He screams in an unholy agony in which he has never felt until this point. The woman looks at him calmly. Choose your next words carefully, Mr. Brogan. I do not take very kindly to any kind of disrespect. Or that of me loved ones. Why is he so important to you? You bitch! He snarls. She laughs softly. Do you really want to know? I want to know how the fuck he was able to escape that charnel pit that was that house. That's what I want to know, he snarls. She sighs lightly. I cannot tell you. He will not speak of it. But I can tell you this. I can speak of when I met him. And that is the best I can do. Are you willing to hear it? Or do you desire to die here and now? Take your time. I am patient, but I'm not that patient. We clear. He takes his time before he nods for her to go ahead and to speak of her own experiences in this entire horrible tragedy. Mirrodin's story begins right after the time of Alexander the Great. Her father, Brius Triculus, a true warrior, born and bred. A vicious man. A cruel man. Violated an oracle in Athens. As punishment for his vicious bloodlust and his seeking of power and fame, to always have his memory seen in the light of the sun, he would be cursed. He wanted immortality and to be remembered, he would be. He wanted to always bathe in the blood of his enemies? Fair enough. He would have to feed from the blood of his enemies, as well as that of the innocent, to survive. His teeth have changed. They become fangs. His strength becomes truly terrifying. He is able to lift many tons worth of weight, to rip people asunder. His enemies, they flee from him in terror. He does not age. He thinks... Stupid woman. She didn't curse me. She gave me a gift from the gods. However, time stales a lot of his ambition. He doesn't grow lazy, no. But he is humbled by the things he has seen. Among them, of course, the Romans. The Romans, when they conquer Greece, are brutal. He himself is forced to flee and hired in foreign lands. It is during this time that he decides to have a family. He takes a wife. She has a son. His name is Nikolai. Things seem quite well at first until his 18th birthday. He becomes himself a creature much like his father. Brius is able to stand the son. As a matter of fact, he seems to grow stronger from it. 
However, upon Nikolai's 18th birthday, he himself cannot handle the sun. His heart stops beating, and of course he must feed on blood. This causes an irreversible rift between the two. In a rage, as well as anger and frustration of the situation, Brius loses control, and he kills his wife, drinking upon her blood, feasting upon her, turning her into a nothing but a mummified husk. This, of course, is the deal breaker. Nikolai walks away. He does not turn on his father permanently, because there is still an immortal bond, and unfortunately for Nikolai, there is no one truly he can relate to, except for his father. The two keep in contact, but Nikolai never truly forgives him for the death of his mother. But in the end, Brias never truly forgave himself. In a desire for some type of redemption, he decides that maybe it would be best to travel abroad, to go to the lands of Gaul. He does just that. He takes a second wife. Things seem quite well for the two of them. As a matter of fact, he accepts what he is. And during this period of time, he has learned different types of things with the effect of his blood. He had actually tried to turn on another woman and who had gathered his fancy into a creature like him by giving her his blood. The results of that were far from pleasant. She had died as if she had been poisoned by snake venom in his arms. So despite the fact he knows this new love of his will grow old, and she knows it as well, she accepts this, and she desires to bear his child, a daughter. Mirden Triculus is born, but unfortunately her birth causes the woman, a woman named Moara, to die. Mirden never forgives herself for her mother's death, so she is very dedicated to her father. She learns everything that she can from him. And it is possible Brius blames her, at least she thinks, even though that's not truly the case. It is not that he blamed her for his wife at the time's death, no. It's that he did not want to lose her like he did Moira, or Nikolai in the end. So he's very very determined to keep from failing her like he did his first son. He teaches her what he knows, and the ways of war, business, espionage, and just living life in itself. He teaches her how to control her gifts when she turns 18. Of course, there was no secrets this time. Things were in the open. She knew what to expect, mentally. But the physical changes for a female are quite different. Needless to say, once the hormonal shift truly occurred, and certain things stopped, Pain was almost unbearable for her until the process was complete. Despite this, she always was lonely. She has always been lonely, especially during this period of time. Despite her father's best efforts, she could not truly bond with anyone. She sought someone who would accept her for her, other than her father. Many men, of course, would definitely try to suit her, and Brius didn't have much say in the matter. Once her mind was made up on something, she was going to do it. The warrior had long since accepted this, and as long as he did not bring any harm to his little girl, he wouldn't get involved too much. It is during this time, you have to understand, she was born after the, she was born literally a, quite a good bit after the death of Christ. So therefore, there are these new people, Christians. I'm not sure if that's what they're called during this period of time, but they are known as followers of Christ and his teachings. She meets a young man named Petrus, a young Roman man, a decent fellow, a true individual who speaks from the heart, and he captures her eye. She truly falls not just head over heels, but truly in love with this man. Beyond that, she feels that her soul is truly bonded with this fellow. Petrus is a fairly decent young man, as I've said. His family, they're a family of merchants. However, his faith 
as well as his beliefs. They're definitely out there and not accepted by Roman society at this period of time. And during this period, she tries to protect him as best she can with her abilities. Her, old, her older brother, Nikolai, had learned how to actually make someone immortal like himself. She had planned on doing the same with him. But she had not truly revealed what she was to Petrus. Unfortunately, it is too late. He is rounded up by the soldiers, the centurions, and crucified. And by the time she finds him, it is too late. This is the current part of where David comes into things. You have to understand. And it will be revealed later. But you have to understand this part of her past to understand the present. The young man Petrus, a young, tall, powerfully built man, is dead, hanging upon a cross. The red-headed woman, known as Mirad and Triculos, kneels, <laughs> crying, <laughs> crying her heart out, blood tears staining her cheeks. The soldiers could care less. They stand at attention. A few others talk among themselves. They do not notice the strangeness of what they see before them, or what they would see before them, had they been paying attention. She feels her hands elongate into claws. She resists the urge to tear these men, literally limb from limb, and she is about to. However, her father's powerful hand calms her. This is not the time. Do you understand me? She wheels to face him. How can you say that? You have to understand, this is before she settled into Ireland. She would travel through Gaul and stay there for quite some time. And then she would settle on the Emerald Isle itself for many centuries. And this, of course, was where her accent would pick up in current times. The red-headed woman looks to her father. She's actually a little taller than the man. And, of course, Brius... When he had taken Mawar as his wife, well, she had definitely been also a quiet, statuesque young woman. But Brius is broad of build, powerful. The young man who was Petrus was tall and lanky, but still a warrior, and a decent fellow in all rights. He had actually resisted all the way to his death. Brius can respect that. He speaks softly. Lashing out and killing these vermin will do no good, and it will not bring him back. She looks at him, almost as if saying she's about ready to accuse him of cowardice. But he very softly whispers in his slightly taller daughter's ear, Mind your tongue and trust me. Do you understand? He brooks no argument. She nods slowly. Stand back. And with this, he speaks to one of the lead, basically to one of the lead men. Not quite a centurion, but close. You there, come forth. His eyes flicker black for a moment. As the man seems to actually fall under Brius's control, this is something he had learned a couple of centuries ago, right after he discovered truly what the curse of his blood could do. His mind reaches forth, taking a slight bit of suggestion over the man's will, and he approaches. You there, what is your name? My name is Narcus. What is it to you, stranger? I'm willing to pay handsomely to have this body here taken down and put in my own personal my own personal crypt. Do you understand? <laughs> That's amusing. I think that was done to the Christos as well, was it not? He says mockingly. And of course the Christos was definitely what was known of course as Christ. Now you have to understand this is well before the time that 
the Roman Catholic Church came into power, but such things were definitely mentioned, and of course it's a now subject of derision, pretty much, but in the end, Brius ignores the man's, uh, smart tongue. He speaks once more. I repeat what I have said. I will pay handsomely. You will do as I say. You will not ask questions. I want this done within the next 24 hours. Brought to your superiors. I know they will accept. The man nods slowly. And he goes forth to do as commanded. Once everything is settled, Petrus's body is taken down. And is in turn, embraced his personal crypt. For his own family had disowned him for his faith. And thus, now, this chapter, at least of the past, is closed. The former cop sags in his chair, barely able to keep conscious. It's kind of fucked up dying like that. Mirrodin raises a brow, listening to him. That kid you were sweet on. Petrus or whatever. I grew up in a Catholic family. I know very well what crucifixion does. It was kind of shoved down my throat when I was a kid. He coughs up blood, spits it at her feet. It's a bad way to go. But I don't get it. Why are you telling me this? What does it have to do with... He chooses his words very carefully. What does that have to do with David? Now. That's a very good question, Mr. Brogan. But I'm not going to tell you now. It's your turn to explain a few things to me. But you are too weak to do so. So what are you going to do? Kill me? Figured it was about fucking time, he says mockingly. She rolls her eyes and places a hand on his forehead. The man blacks out the chair. She steadies him to keep him from falling to the floor. She very calmly cuts, with long nail, a cut in the palm of her hand. Her blood bleeds black, which is of course common. Actually, very much the norm for the eldest of her kind. Mainly, the three purebloods, her and her two brothers. She very calmly places the cut over the wound, which of course still in his shoulder, which still has that fire poker sticking out of it. She could possibly yank it out of him without killing him, but in the end, she doesn't really want to. It's not like he's going to be alive much longer anyway. But she allows her blood to flow into the wound. This stabilizes him at least for another 24 hours. It doesn't weak her significantly, but she definitely feels a transfer of energy. She calmly walks to another part of the room. There's a cot there. She's definitely had to in the past, in similar situations, carry out interrogations like this. She does not enjoy doing it. Unfortunately, she has no choice here. She lifts the man easily enough and places him gently in the cot. She figures he'll sleep there for a time, at least roughly 12 hours, and she'll come back. And he'll respond with the answers she desires to understand, or she will kill him. It's that simple. The answers David has always refused to share with her trouble her, and it's not that he does not trust her. She's aware of that. It's that he feels shame, and he also feels quite a bit of pride. She could always glean the thoughts from their connection through his blood, through his memories, but that's a violation of the worst order, and that's not something she would ever do. At least not to one that she loves. And believe me, she is capable of that. She 
Turns the light off, making sure the room is secure. She goes upstairs. Up the stairs to the master bedroom. The young man is still out cold, but his chest rises and falls with each breath. She can sense his thoughts as well. They're jumbled, chaotic, which of course is common with sleep. She sits down on the bed and calmly traces a lock of hair away from his face and his eyes. She bites her lip. The only thing she can do right now is watch him and wait. He'll be fine. But she cannot push that man further downstairs for any more answers without risk of killing him. She just prays that she will get them soon enough. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this chapter. Many more will be coming out in the near future. Unfortunately, I cannot give you an exact timetable on when they will come out. It's simply pretty much how my mind works. However, I do promise you this story is taking precedence over most of my other projects, so you'll definitely will be hearing more very soon. You guys be blessed and be safe.